So I'd like to speak a message today that I've entitled Prophecy 101. Prophecy 101. If I could have you open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to start in the very first verse. In the scriptures, they read this way. I'm reading from the NLT this week. It says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered together to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision or revelation or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that God called, that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. Now you know, sometimes when Sarah's gone for the afternoon or gone for the day and I've got to go do something, uh, sometimes I'll leave a note for her. I'll leave a note and let her know where I'm going and what I'm up to. Um, I'm sure that you've all done the same thing, right? We've all left a note for our loved one. Uh, I don't think I'm strange in doing that. Um, But when we write that note, the whole purpose of it is to be clear, right? We want to be clear and and, and concise. We want to let our loved one know where we've been. We don't leave a note, something like this, that says, My dearest love, I've gone yonder to the place in which the animals dwell. I am in search of a solution to our problem with our roaming varmint. Therefore, I will will return with a tethering device. If you wish to reach me to profess your undying love, you will know where I reside for the afternoon. See, now, if you got a note like that, chances are pretty good. You'd look at it and you'd go, what in the world did I just read? We might even wonder what that person was on, right? We would be thinking, what did they just say? What we want and what we expect is a letter that says something like, hey dear, I went to the uh, pet store today to get a leash for the dog. Um, Might take me the whole afternoon, but I should be back a little later. Something that we understand, right? Well, I think if we're honest, a lot of us, when we start reading prophecy and scriptures, we kind of look at it like that previous letter. We kind of look at it and we go, what? in the world did I just read? What in the world? Are they talking about a wheel inside of a wheel? What are they talking about? About a dragon swiping his tail and a third of the stars are going to fall from heaven. What in the world is he talking about? And the truth is, is that many people, when they start reading prophecy and they get to those parts that are kind of tough to understand, we kind of skip those verses, right? Right? A lot of times, if we're honest, a lot of times we get to those verses and we'll start kind of skipping them. But here's the problem. 27% of the Bible is prophecy. 27%. That means if we never read prophecy and we always kind of skip those parts and act like it doesn't exist, we are essentially pretending that one quarter of the Bible, a little more than one quarter of the Bible, just doesn't exist. Now, I think what happens a lot of times is there's two questions that people want answered. People go to prophecy for two answers. One, when is Jesus Christ coming? And two, when is the end of the world? Right? Those are the two questions that a lot of people want to know. So what I'm going to do today is I want to speak for a few moments, and I want to speak as clearly as I can. And I wanted to make as clearly as possible explain what the Bible teaches about the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right? So the first thing we must understand, before we can get into the details, the first thing we must understand is that Jesus Christ has not returned yet. Is that pretty agreeable? I think we all can agree there, that Jesus Christ has not returned, right? So knowing that Jesus Christ has not returned, this is what it tells us. It tells us, that we still have time. 
we still have this short window of opportunity to tell people about Jesus Christ. We still have this short opportunity, this small window to tell people about the hope that can be found in Jesus in this region, in our families, in our homes before it's too late. See, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1 says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered together to meet Him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Say that with me, already begun. Already begun. So don't be alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. So Paul starts off this chapter and he says, Let me clarify a few things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to be with Him. Now, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gathering together to be with Him, the church has simply coined a single word to sum it all up that just is the, uh, oh my goodness, I just blanked. The rapture, right, the rapture. So when you hear someone in the church refer to the rapture, this is what we're referring to. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to be with Him. Simple as that, it's right in front of us. So now Paul writes this church, the Thessalonians, and apparently people have been teaching them that the day of the Lord has already begun. Now, the word already begun is actually one Greek word. That one Greek word means present or presently at that very moment. And so what these false teachers were teaching them was that they were presently going through the great tribulation and they had missed the rapture. And so these people were discouraged. They were hopeless. They were, they were beside themselves because these false teachers were teaching them you had missed it. You had already missed the whole thing. And so Paul writes them, and he says, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. The day of the Lord has not begun. It hasn't, it isn't presently happening. And so he's trying to encourage them. He's trying to encourage them because they're hopeless. Now you say, you may say, how do you know for sure that they're hopeless, that they're struggling? Aren't you just inferring that? Well, actually, if you jump ahead to verse 15 through 17 you know, of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says this, with all these things in mind, that's the details he's going to give about the end times. With all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teaching that we passed on to you, both in person and in by letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us and by His grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. Now here's the question. Why would Paul explain God as a God of eternal comfort and a wonderful hope? And why would he pray for them to be strengthened and comforted if this isn't what they were needing. See, they had written to him. They were concerned because they were struggling. And so Paul writes back to them and he's telling them and he's trying to help them be comforted, right? So now, I like to watch hockey. And when I watch hockey and you watch a fair amount of hockey, what ends up happening is you find the difference between a championship caliber team and a team that's probably not going to go far. See, when you watch a hockey game and you see a championship caliber team and they're down by a couple goals and there's five minutes left, they jump over the boards and they start pushing the pace of the game. They start throwing pucks at the net. They push and they push and they push until they get those goals and they win the game. They play as hard as they can. Now you watch a team that's probably not going to go far and they're down by a couple goals with just a few minutes left in the game. The camera pans the bench. And there they are with their head in their hands. They're defeated. They're dejected. They've they've already lost this game in their mind. So they jump over the boards. And for the last five minutes, all they do is simply play the game out. They just try to get to that end buzzer, right? Well, the truth is, is that when we look at the world around us, we are seeing 
more violence, we are seeing more immorality, and we are seeing more and more hatred toward Christianity every day. And the truth is, is that sometimes it can start to feel like it's just a little bit hopeless. This Thessalonian church, they looked around them and all they saw was more and more violence. All they saw was more and more immorality every day. Every day they looked around and they saw more and more people hating them for their beliefs. Persecution is what they were facing at this time. They were starting to feel hopeless. But let me tell you something. How the church reacts to the situation around us and how the church reacts to the world around us will directly decide and directly affect if we are going to just be dejected, if we are just going to be hopeless, and we are going to play it out till the buzzer sounds, or if we are going to be overcomers, and we are going to be victorious in this. See, I for one, I choose to take the attitude that we still have a little bit of time. Even though the world around me is getting more and more violent and there's more and more terrorist attacks happening by the day and by the month, I choose to believe that we can still go out and we can still teach people about Jesus Christ. We still have an opportunity, a short window, even though the world around me is getting more and more immoral. Every day we are coming up, our society is coming up with better and more different ways to become more and more immoral. And I see that we still have a short period of time. The time is not gone yet. We can still teach people in this region. We can still tell our loved ones that there's deliverance. There is hope that's in Jesus Christ. The world around us is hating us more and more for our belief system. They are hating our values. They are hating our principles. But the scriptures tell me that the day of the Lord has not begun yet. We still have time. We still have time to reach this region. We still have time to reach our families. We've got to be urgent because time is running out, but time hasn't run out yet. So the first thing we must understand about the second coming of Christ is that it hasn't happened yet. And we need a little bit of urgency. We need to realize that time is still on our, well, it's not really on our side, but we still have time right now. So what are we going to do? Are we going to sit on our bench, dejected, and play it out until the final buzzer? Or are we going to go out into this region, and are we going to reach as many people as we can possibly reach in the name of Jesus Christ? The next thing we must understand about the second coming of the Lord is that we must guard our hearts and our minds and be careful not to be deceived. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Don't be fooled by what they say. For the day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. So it's laid out in Scripture before us, as clear as it's going to get. There are two things that have to happen before Jesus returns. There's First, there has got to be a great rebellion against God. Some scriptures call it the great apostasy, or some scriptures call it the great turning away. But there's got to be a great apostasy, and the man of lawlessness has got to be revealed. Now, this man of lawlessness in other parts of the scripture, we call him the Antichrist. So the Antichrist has to be revealed. Now, this word in scripture, the Greek word used that we've translated revealed, means what was presently or previously unknown becomes known. So what was previously unknown, who the Antichrist is, becomes known. We are going to know who the Antichrist is. The scriptures teach us plain and simple right there. We are going to know who he is. There's not going to be this guessing game. There's not going to be going around and saying, no, I think that guy's the Antichrist, that follows the Antichrist. No, 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 it's that guy. No, the Bible says we are going to know who he is. In fact, Paul tells us exactly how we are going to know. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 and 10 says this, This man, the Antichrist, 
will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. This is how we're going to know that it's the Antichrist. He is going to come with power, with signs and wonders and miracles. So what that tells us is, no matter how evil we see people on this earth, no matter how much, how much prestige and power somebody gets, they cannot be the Antichrist until we start seeing them deceiving people by having signs and wonders and miracles. It's a prerequisite to it being the Antichrist. It's got to be that way. And so the scripture tells us that there are going to be many people who are deceived by this man. The Antichrist is going to deceive a lot of people. So that means this man is going to be a man of influence. He's going to be a household name. The world is going to know who he is. But it also says that he is going to deceive them because, because they will only, wait, I missed my verse, because they do not love or accept the truth that would save them. So they are going to be deceived because they do not love or accept the truth that would save them. This truth is Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. Jesus Christ came, lived a sinless life, And then he died on the cross for your sin and mine. He paid the price for sin so that we don't have to. But the Bible says that we have got to commit our lives to him. We have got to accept that sacrifice. We have got to love him and follow his commands. See, there are many people who know the verses. They know by head knowledge that Jesus Christ came. They know that he died for their sins. They know that there's certain things that we can and cannot do in this life. There's certain commands that he gave us. There is a certain standard that we must live by. They know it, but the truth is, is that they don't truly love God and they don't truly accept him because they've never really committed to him. Is it possible that there's some here today and maybe you're hearing this or maybe you're online and you're hearing this and you know the stories. You've read the Bible. You maybe even have have memorized some Bible verses and you know what the Bible says, but when you look inside and you search the deepest part of your heart where none of us can see, you know that you truly haven't committed your life to Jesus. You still continue to live the same old way. You know that you truly don't love Him. You know you truly haven't accepted that sacrifice. Well, if that's you, you need to know that the Scriptures challenge us, and I'm challenging you today, not to wait one more day. Make today that day Because the truth is, is that the Antichrist could be revealed at any moment. And when he's revealed, it doesn't really give us a timetable, I don't think, of of when Christ is going to return. He's going to come back. And when he does, time is, it's run out. It's too late. And so I challenge you today. I challenge you if you're hearing this and and you, you don't, you know in your heart of hearts that you don't truly love and you don't, haven't truly accepted Him. Make today that day. So we know that before Christ returns, that we're going to be able to see the Antichrist. He's going to be revealed. We're going to know who He is. But as well, the Scripture says that there's going to be this great rebellion against God or this great apostasy or turning away from the Lord. So the Bible tells us exactly how to know the Antichrist. He's going to come in signs and wonders, and and there's going to be all these miracles. But what about the great apostasy? How are we going to know? How are we going to know if we're living in the great apostasy? 
Well, Paul tells us in chapter 2, verse 12 of 2 Thessalonians, then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. So the Antichrist is going to deceive them, and then they are going to be condemned. They're going to be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Is it possible that we are living in the great rebellion right now? Could it be possible that we are living in the great apostasy right now and all we've done is give it a fancy new modern name called relativism? See, relativism can be defined by just a simple phrase. What's right for you might not be right for me. Or what's wrong to you might not be wrong to me. See, our children are being indoctrinated in school with this philosophy. We are being indoctrinated with this philosophy every day by Hollywood and by media. Every day, our politicians are standing up and promoting this kind of philosophy. What's right for me might not be right for you. Therefore, you shouldn't be able to force what you think is right on me. We've all heard it, right? In fact, this philosophy shows up far more than I think we realize. You might have heard this one. You might think it's wrong to kill an unborn baby in the womb, but maybe I don't think it's wrong. What you think is immoral might not be what I think is immoral. How about this one? What you think that verse means might not be what I think that verse means. How you view God might not be how I view God. See, our world is trying to remove the idea of absolute truth. And they're trying to replace it with their own interpretation of the truth. It's called relativism. See, growing up, I was raised in church and I heard these messages of end times. And I heard about the great apostasy and the great rebellion. And immediately what I thought was, was that, Churches were going to keep emptying out and emptying out until finally there was no churches left and then God was going to return. But the truth is, is that's not how it's going to happen at all. See, that's, that's not how it's happening right now. See, there are teachers standing behind pulpits all across the world that are teaching what the Bible says is evil is actually good. And it's all in the way you interpret it. See, they're easy to pick out. It's easy to figure these guys out because you'll hear phrases like this. Are you sure that that's immoral? Are you sure that's what the Bible teaches? Are you sure that the Bible teaches that all sin needs to be removed from our life? Are you sure you got that right? Are you sure you're just not interpreting it a little bit wrong? Are you sure that the Bible says that there's only one way to heaven? Are you, are you absolutely sure? Are you sure it's just not in the way you're interpreting it? See, the truth is, is that that one line, are you sure? Are you sure? And they're casting that doubt. Do you know that we actually see almost that exact same phrase in Scripture? Let me give you a little, little verse. Genesis 3 verse 1 says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say that you must not eat the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? In other words... Are you sure that that's wrong? Are you sure that that's immorality? Are you, are you sure that there's only one way to heaven? Are you, are you really sure? See, churches are filling up. And people are feeding on this false teaching, not realizing that they are going to be condemned for loving evil rather than believing the truth. Think about that for a second. The scriptures tell us that they're going to be deceived 
and that they're going to be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing truth. And all across the world, there are teachers standing up and what has been taught as evil for 2,000 years, suddenly, in 20 years, there's this great revelation that suddenly it's not evil. Is that not a little bit fishy? Is it maybe, just maybe, is it possible that this relativistic and relativism has creeped into the church? I believe that the scriptures teach us that we are living in the great apostasy right now. I believe we are seeing it and we are living it right now. And I believe, if that's the case, that the scriptures teach us that there are two things that we need to watch out for before the second coming of the Lord. That's the great apostasy, and that is the revealing of the Antichrist. And if we are in the middle of the great apostasy, that means we're halfway there. That means at any moment, the Antichrist could be revealed, the buzzer's going to sound, and it's over. It'll be done. And so, if that's the case, we have a short window of opportunity, church. We have a short window of opportunity to tell as many people as we can, the best way we possibly can, that Jesus Christ is returning and there is salvation in Him and no one else. There is no other way. See, relativism says that there's a whole bunch of ways to figure out truth. But the scripture says that this is absolute truth. There is no, no kind of figuring out different interpretations. There is one way to interpret this book. One way. And it's truth. Everyone around is trying to remove absolute truth. But God is trying to show us that there is most certainly absolute truth and we must follow it. I'm going to conclude here. I am not preaching this message today to scare you into a deeper relationship with Jesus. I did not preach this for that reason. I did not preach this today to condemn you. That is not why I am preaching this. I have no intention and no desire to condemn you. The reason I am preaching this is because I love you. I love you. See, when we were children, our parents told us never to get in a car with a stranger. They told us not to do it. They didn't tell us that because we had already gotten in a car with a stranger. And, and they were reprimanding us. They told us because they understood the dangers that could come with us getting in a car with a stranger. They didn't want us hurt. They loved us. See, I'm preaching this to you today because the danger of deception is real. It is real. There are real people standing up and preaching false doctrines and, and, and leading people to a life to enjoy evil when they are going to be condemned for not believing the truth. It's real. And the problem is, is the punishment for that is real. Hell is real. And so the scriptures teach us when it says that they will be condemned. That simply means that those people are going to spend eternity in hell because they were deceived. And I love you. The scripture says that one day the church is going to be gathered together and we're going to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. And I want you to be gathered together with me. I don't want you to perish. That is why I was led to preach this message instead of a heart of love. If I could have every head bowed and every eye closed. If there is anybody here today or anyone at home that has heard this message 
and you know the Lord's been speaking to you throughout this whole message and you're here and you're saying I want to commit my life to Jesus Christ I want to truly love him accept his sacrifice and believe the truth if that's you just raise a hand where you're at say that's me I see those hands Lord Jesus I thank you Lord that that God your Holy Spirit that you Holy Spirit have, have spoken that you Holy Spirit have confirmed this message in people's hearts and Lord I just pray that God you would give them the strength and you would give them the courage to be able to live this life for you Lord, not to be torn this way and that and not to be deceived by false teachers, but to stand firm in truth. Stand firm in truth. Lord, if there's any at home, Lord God, who's raised a hand and said that that was them, Lord God, I pray that you would give them strength. Lord, I can't lay my hands on them and I can't pray with them today, but God... Where they're at, I just pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them where they're at. That you would, you would give them the courage to live this life out for you. Lord, if they're listening to people who are teaching false doctrine. And Lord, they've been convicted as we've been preaching here today. And they know that that person is not teaching truth. Then God, give them the courage and give them the strength to turn the TV off. And remove that from their mind. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've done here and everything you're going to do here. In your name we pray.